There's a countless number of things that people have said can cause cancer. Ranging from things like the sun, to contraceptive pills. Doctors have been trying to make a comprehensive list of the things that cause the disease mainly so that we know what steps to take to prevent ourselves from ever getting cancer, as we all know that prevention is better than cure. We've only figured out how to prevent 40% of cancer cases so far, but our current knowledge of the biological mechanism and causes of cancer is quite extensive compared to that of the past. In the first of two videos regarding the history of cancer, I'll go through the earliest theories about what people thought cancer was, then how the cause of cancer was eventually discovered, and how these discoveries has led to the current measures to prevent people from ever getting cancer. Cancer is an umbrella term for a group of diseases caused by uncontrollable cell growth, with the cancerous cells then being able to spread to other parts of the body. All animals can get cancer, and we've even found tumours in dinosaur fossils. The earliest mention of cancer in human writings are seen in ancient Egyptian medical texts, where they gave very intricate details about the characteristics of tumours. The Edwin Smith Papyrus described a breast tumour as being bulging, cold to the touch, and spread all over the chest. It was mainly religious figures like priests who cared for cancer patients, and cancer at the time was believed to be caused by supernatural forces and divine figures. We need to go to ancient Greece during the 5th century BC to find the first physical explanation for the cause of cancer. Hippocrates wrote in depth about cancer and many other aspects of medicine, and developed the system of four humours. The basis of the system was that all diseases were caused by an excess or defect in one of the four humours, and he stated that cancer was specifically caused by an excess in black bowel. He also gave us the name cancer, which is the Greek word for crab, because when he cut open a tumour, it resembled a crab, as it had many vessels spreading out of it. The writings about cancer from Hippocrates influenced many doctors after him, and the humoral theory of cancer was the leading explanation for the next 2,000 years. But once people started to perform dissections of the human body to explore its anatomy, the black bowel theory started to fall apart. Doctors like William Harvey led us to understand how the cardiovascular system worked and the presence of the venous, arterial and lymphatic system was discovered, but black bowel was nowhere to be found. The new explanation for cancer's cause was based on the lymphatic system, and we can credit this to the French surgeon Henri-Francois Ledran. In the 18th century, he stated that cancer first develops locally within a specific organ, and then it metastasizes to other parts of the body through the lymphatic system. So that explained how cancer was able to spread, but did it explain how cancer was able to form in the first place? As the lymphatic system was shown to be very significant to cancer, the leading theory among scientists was that cancer was formed by the clotting and decay of lymphatic fluid. The theory didn't last very long though, as the technology of microscopes were improving and people could look at the human body at an even deeper level. In 1838, two German scientists proposed that all living things are composed of cells, and that cells are the basic unit of life, analogous to how in chemistry atoms are the basic unit of matter. The professor Johannes Müller was then able to observe cancer cells with a microscope, but he incorrectly thought that cancer cells come from small offshoots of normal cells. But then Rudolf Virchow, who was another student of Müller, popularised the phrase omnicellular e cellular, so in the 1850s, it became widely accepted that normal cells directly transformed into cancer cells. But what exactly caused the normal cell to turn into a cancerous cell? 
The question was fiercely debated over the next century by the medical community, and at the beginning of the 20th century, three leading schools of thought about the cause of cancer would emerge. The three theories were infectious disease, genetic inheritance, and poisonous chemicals. Scientists from each school of thought were adamant that they were correct, and they all seemed to have evidence to support their theory. In support of the infectious disease theory, an American doctor called Peyton Routes was able to transfer a sarcoma from one chicken to another chicken, and he discovered that a virus was responsible for this cancer. The genetic inheritance theory was supported by the German Theodor Bavari, who provided proof that genetic material was carried by chromosomes. He was also able to create cancer cells in sea urchins by fertilizing an egg cell with two sperm cells in 1902. He also theorized the existence of a cancer-causing oncogene. There was also evidence for the chemical theory going all the way back to 1775 in England. Percival Potts demonstrated a strong link between soot exposure in chimney sweepers and scrotum cancer in young men. The chemical theory of cancer was proven by Japanese researchers in 1915, who were able to give rabbits skin cancer by rubbing coal tar on their ears. We now know today that all of these theories were correct, but the genetic theory was probably the most correct out of the three. The first ever oncogene was discovered in the 1970s, thanks to research in America on the previously mentioned Rao sarcoma virus. The virus was found to contain a gene that promoted cell division called SRC. The researchers found that when the virus infected a chicken, it incorporated itself into the chicken's genome, which eventually caused cancer to develop. This proved beyond any doubt that cancer was caused by genetic mutations, and our understanding of how cancer forms improved even further, as we discovered several more genes that promote cell division, as well as several other genes that suppress it. With the knowledge of what the causes of cancer are, we now have many effective methods to prevent people from ever developing cancer in the first place, which has drastically reduced the incidence of many types of cancer. We can give people vaccinations that prevent them from getting viruses that cause things like cervical or liver cancer. In terms of preventing carcinogenic chemicals, we have public health measures like the banning of the use of asbestos or the numerous anti-smoking campaigns to reduce lung cancer. And people can now be tested to see if they have genes that make them more likely to develop specific cancers and can even have those parts of the body removed before they can ever develop cancer. I also need to give a special mention to screening programs, which employs techniques from all branches of diagnostic medicine and allows doctors to detect and treat cancer at an early stage of the disease, so people are more likely to survive. But like I mentioned at the start of the video, we still have no way to prevent around 60% of cancer cases, and as the population gets older, the rates of cancer continue to increase. So it seems like the only way to fully eliminate all cancers is to find a cure for it. So my next video will focus on the history of cancer treatments and the ongoing rates to find a cure.